What's up guys, Jake here. In this video, let's deviate from my normal content and have a little fun. About two weeks ago on my channel, I made a video titled Science of Bob Lazar's UFO Explored. Got a lot of views, got a lot of interest. However, when I made that video, I had only watched the Netflix documentary Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers and watched the Joe Rogan podcast dated June 20th, 2019, uh, it's about two hours long, and it's got 15 million views. So there's definitely some interest in Bob Lazar's story. However, in this video, Bob didn't really go into the full details of Element 115 and, and the reactor for uh, the UFO. So people were telling me, Jake, go check out Bob Lazar's video from 1992, and you can watch this for free if you want on Amazon Prime. It's titled UFOs and Area 51, the Bob Lazar video and excerpts from the government Bible. You can probably also find this on YouTube. However, they're not official copies, so the videos might be deleted, so I can't include any links. But if you really wanna find this video, you can. And it's pretty silly in that Bob is trying to look cool, I guess. He's like driving this Corvette at the beginning of the movie, but then it just turns into a whiteboard presentation. And he goes into a lot of interesting details about his experience that he claims working at Area 51 on this uh, UFO spacecraft. So I'm gonna get into the details of his lecture. And once again, disclaimer, everything in this video is pure science fiction thinking. I cannot verify or disprove Bob Lazar's claims. I'm not even gonna try. But I wanna talk about it because I think there's something interesting about Bob Lazar's story from a science fiction standpoint. If intelligent advanced aliens exist in our galaxy, why haven't they just come here, annihilated us, and taken our planets? There's all these movies like Independence Day, War of the World, Edge of Tomorrow, where we're constantly being invaded by advanced civilizations, alien life forms, basically to wipe us out and then take our planet. Why, why hasn't this happened? And Bob Lazar's story actually gives a very sensible explanation why, why they haven't come here. So let's recap what Bob is saying and then we'll get into the science fiction theory of why aliens haven't wiped this out. So I'm actually a little mad at Bob because in the Joe Rogan podcast and the Netflix movie, he was using gravity as a general term. He was, he was talking about gravity amplifiers and gravity emitters from element 115. So I assumed he was talking about gravitation, one of the four fundamental forces of nature, but he's actually not. Uh, he describes it in his 92 video that there's two forms of gravity. There's gravity A and gravity B. Gravity B it stands for big gravity. So when mass is concentrated, a moon, a planet, a star, a black hole, then it can pull on objects close to it. All mass in the universe has this very slight weak gravitational force. But what Bob is talking about as a power source for his alien spacecraft is gravity A, and gravity A is on the atomic level. And gravity A has a, has a more mainstream standard name. It's called the strong interaction. This is one of the four fundamental forces of nature. So the strong interaction is what keeps protons and neutrons held together in the nucleus of an atom, which is the strongest of the four fundamental forces. I didn't know this in my last video, so thanks, thanks for using the wrong term, Bob. So what Bob is claiming is he had his hands on a stable isotope of element 115. Now in the 1980s, element 115 wasn't officially on the periodic table yet. It was discovered in 2003, meaning that scientists had used a particle collider to momentarily collide some atoms in order to create 115. However, it's not stable, it immediately decayed. Bob is saying that somewhere in the galaxy, either element 115 naturally occurs or advanced civilizations have a way of synthetically creating a stable isotope of 115. So what Bob is claiming about the nucleus of this atom is that it is so large, so massive, and still stable somehow, 
that with 115 protons in its nucleus and like 170 uh, neutrons in its nucleus, the strong interaction force, the strong gravity force, he keeps saying, extends beyond the nucleus of the atom. This, do this doesn't happen with smaller elements, but because the strong interaction on all of these protons and neutrons in the nucleus is so, so tight, so strong, it actually extends a little bit, a little bit past the nucleus, creating a gravitational field beyond the atom, uh, beyond, beyond the nucleus. And when, when this happens, you can start manipulating the atom to do some really amazing things. So I'm assuming at some point element 15 has to be mined and refined and concentrated. And Bob describes the fuel rod as basically this little triangle shape. Uh, he says it only has to be 223 grams, which is about half a pound. And this fuel source in the reactor of his UFO uh, can power the ship for 20 to 30 years, which is a fantastic claim. So the element 115 is placed in the center of a cyclotronic particle accelerator, and then uh, protons are going to be shot at it. So the protons are accelerated, it collides into the, 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 the triangle of element 115, and when a proton enters the nucleus of a stable isotope of 115, once again, these are all of his uh, claims in the 92 documentary, but 115 becomes element 116. I guess on the periodic table, this is called Livermorium. And element 116 is not stable. When a proton enters the nucleus of 116, the atom is unhappy, and within a second or seconds, it'll decay, and it'll eject an antimatter particle, uh, an antiproton. So real quick, we gotta talk about antimatter, and the theory goes that at the creation of the universe, an equal amount of matter and antimatter was created. And the antimatter has an equal mass, uh, but an opposite charge to all of the matter in existence. Now this leads to a, a host of problems and questions, such as if antimatter is equal to matter in the universe, where did it all go? Where is it? And Antimatter, once again, opposite charge, equal mass. So the proton in a nucleus of an atom has a positive charge. So the antiproton of an atom, for example, an antihydrogen, would have a negative charge in the nucleus. That's a little strange. Electrons, we know, have a negative charge. However, the opposite of an electron is called a positron, and a positron has a positive charge. Now we can prove that antimatter is real and that it exists because we can create it in, in particle accelerators. However, we can only store it for a small period of time. And the problem is whenever antimatter collides or touches matter, it, 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 it annihilates, it destroys itself. So when a, uh, when a electron and a positron touch or, or, or combine, uh, they both lose their charge and two photons of light are emitted, so they're, they're ejected. And when a proton and an antiproton collide, uh, they also annihilate, but this creates a very messy process. So the, the quarks and the gluons, there's a stream of particles ejected from this annihilation event. The only thing we need to know for this video is that a lot of energy is created when a proton and an antiproton touch. So the reactor of Bob's UFO fires a proton at the refined element 115, and when this occurs, a, every time a proton hits an atom, it, it, it increases the atomic number to 116. 116 is unstable, 116 immediately decays, and it releases antimatter. It releases either, uh, I guess, just an antiproton, or maybe an antiproton and a positron. I'm not sure. And this center cylinder is a vacuum because you have to make sure that the antimatter doesn't touch anything, but it's directed at a target gas cloud. This is what Bob said. And when the antimatter touches the, the target, it'll create uh, heat, it'll create energy. And this reactor is, uh, this reactor is basically an antimatter-matter collider which generates thermoelectricity. Bob claims this is a 100% efficient thermoelectric generator, 
thermoelectric generator uh, technology is something that we have. We use radioactive elements that decay in order to power satellites and, and various spacecrafts. So, you know, theoretically, uh, this, this, this is possible, but we have no way of proving this because we don't have any element 115. And all of the, uh, all of the antimatter that we've ever been able to create and store, we've never been able to conduct a test similar to what Bob is proposing here. Now, the problem with Bob's 1992 lecture is he says, great, this reactor generates tremendous power. Okay, but, but how is that power used? Once again, Bob claims there's no cabling or wiring from the reactor to the gravity amplifiers and the gravity emitters. This is, is the real mystery that I, I, still need, I need, still need answers from you, Bob. How the heck are you uh, creating a gravitational field? Okay, so let's say that we've solved the problem of infinite energy. Okay, we've created a reactor that's 100% efficient, that can convert uh, matter to antimatter, collide it together, thermoelectric, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm getting it so far, but how the hell do these drum barrels below the ship create a gravitational field that propels the craft? Bob doesn't explain this. If you guys know, if, if he's ever explained this, let me know. The possibilities here is, one, he doesn't know. They were never allowed to take apart or dissect this part of the ship. Two, it's just beyond our comprehension. Maybe they have opened up the gravity amplifiers and gravity emitters, and it's just a complete, complete mystery how these things work. Or, once again, Bob knows and he doesn't want to explain for some reason, or once again, Bob's just making it all up. But back to the science fiction question of why have we not been invaded by an alien race? Why have we not been wiped out and had our planet taken from us? And the first possibility, which I don't like, is that we are alone in the galaxy or alone in the universe. There's nobody to come here and, 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 and wipe us out to take our stuff. Possible, but not probable. The second explanation that I've always had that gave me comfort at night is that this advanced alien technology civilization, uh, they have something equivalent to Star Trek's Prime Directive, where they're scientists and they're explorers and they're benevolent. <laughs> and because they've achieved this level of technology without destroying themselves, they are inherently peaceful. And they don't want to interrupt the natural development of a lesser technologically advanced race. However, maybe once that uh, lesser race, us, achieves their level comparable of technology, then they'll reveal ourselves, they'll welcome us into the Galactic Federation, and we can all be peaceful and cooperative and learn from each other. But the realization that I'm having listening to Bob Lazar's story is the third possibility. And the third possibility is our solar system is just worthless. It's not even worth taking for any advanced alien race. And this is what I mean by this. If we talk about the history of the universe, going all the way back to the Big Bang, this is a time period of 13 billion years. And for the first 400 million years or so, this is called the Dark Ages. When the Big Bang created all matter in the universe, the only thing we had was hydrogen and a little bit of helium. And it took time for these hydrogen and helium gas clouds to uh, coalesce, come together, to form the first stars. And when the first stars were born, there were no planets. There was, there was no denser, harder elements to form rocky surfaces to, to make planets. So. There weren't even galaxy spirals because there weren't any black holes yet. It took billions of years for these stars to form, go supernova, create the, he the heavier elements on the periodic table of elements, supernova explode, uh, and then we have denser, heavier elements to form the first planets. So when we look at the universal distribution of elements in our solar system today, it only goes up to uranium at 92. It took time uh, throughout the history of the universe for stars to go through this cycle of, of birth and death, through supernovas, through fusion, uh, jamming together smaller, lighter elements to create the larger, heavier ones. And there's, there's kind of this, uh, this, this segmentation that's not shown on this picture, 
But in the beginning, just stars, no planets. Then in the middle, maybe galaxies finally started forming. We had stars with planets. But maybe uh, this is not what the second generation star where uh, basically our solar system is today, what its, its element composition was. It was probably something just down here. So let's, let's think about this. <clears throat> the second generation star had the first planets, but the planets didn't have all the heavier elements yet. What if, and this is just theoretical proposing an idea, what if the second generation star that preceded our current star only had elements up to, for example, iron, element 26? Because the first star that went supernova only had the mass, the heat, and the time to create elements up to 26. However, when the second generation star finally went supernova, it only had the mass and heat and time to get us up to 92. But what's going to happen in our solar system when our star goes supernova, uh, basically for the third time? Is it possible that in, in, in that instance, that our star, when it dies, will create elements, stable elements, past element 92? Now our current star has been cooking for about 4.5 billion years. How much longer does it have before it goes supernova? Probably another couple billion years. So you don't have to panic just yet about, you know, our planet being blown up. But this universal distribution of elements is, is everywhere. It's the signature of our solar system. So any advanced technological alien race that visits our solar system, all they gotta do is find a meteorite, they're called chondrites, and, and test it, and they'll be like, oh, this, this solar system doesn't have elements heavier than, than 92. Then this solar system isn't of use to us. So let's think of it this way. Let's pretend humanity achieved faster than light travel with the elements that we have available to us. Let's pretend that we visited another solar system and discovered in that solar system, they only had elements naturally occurring up to 26, iron. They didn't have copper, silver, gold. They didn't have uranium or plutonium. And everything in our civilization was dependent you know, our fuel source to, to travel through space, all of our technology. They didn't have the rare earth elements for, you know, circuit boards and, and computers. What if we visited a solar system and all they had was up to element 26? We would think that that solar system was pretty worthless, not, not even worth our time of harvesting or, or interacting with. And that's kind of what I'm arguing in this video, is that what's keeping us safe, what's protecting us, if heavier elements are, are possible and have been created in other parts of our galaxy. Is that because we don't have element 115 in our solar system, none of these, none of these advanced alien races are, are interested in us at all. Now, I don't actually like this theory that I'm proposing in this video because there's the doom and gloom that war and competition for limited resources is perpetual. Even, you know, in the future when we've solved so many of our technological problems. I, I don't like this idea that basically there's this eternal war uh, waging, uh, waging in the galaxy, but basically it's for the most valuable resource in the galaxy. These heavier elements that can manipulate gravity or, or, or basically power or fuel their advanced technology. And what is sparing us on our tiny blue marble? It's the fact that we don't have these heavier elements uh, that potentially these advanced civilizations want. So the positive is they're not coming here. We don't have anything they want. The negative is we don't have these elements. We won't be capable of creating their level of technology to ever go find them. Final disclaimer, guys. This was just science fiction thinking. I actually never considered the possibility that there were naturally occurring heavier elements that could achieve uh, different levels of technology for us until I heard Bob Lazar's story. And it has me thinking, if stable isotopes of heavier elements exist on the periodic table of elements, then they definitely occur in other parts of our galaxy and other parts of the universe. And if we were able to get our hands on some and find some, what advanced technology could our, you know, the greatest minds of our planets uh, achieve? It is interesting to consider. 
interesting to think about, something to look forward to if we can ever get our hands on maybe a meteorite that we know has come from another solar system. Okay guys, if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. If you have any comments or questions about anything at all, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care.